And also have a chat on cards, because you want to um, explain how the cards work. Okay, sure. Um, good evening. I'm Helen Harriman, and I'm program director, and tonight I'm the moderator. And uh, we wanted to get your input as much as possible. While I do have questions for the panel, I would like you, after they introduce themselves, if you have a question, you may ask. Uh, you may ask a question of one panel member or all panel members, whatever you'd like to do. I will collect them. So after they've introduced themselves, write them down, like Jeopardy, write them down, and then I will collect them and uh, we'll use those <coughs> to get started. And uh, as the evening goes through, you know, if you have a question uh, and it's not a time, you can raise your hand. That's fine too. Uh, I think. Uh, what time do we take a break? Because we um, were talking about that. But it's almost seven now.
as to what I get. Like uh, headshots, I don't do wall portraits, although I would love to. Uh, I don't do that. I just do digitals. For weddings, I'll do an album and a canvas and digital, et cetera. So not everybody does it differently. Now, Christine is not a photographer. She is a forensic accountant. So you want to tell us what you do? <laughs> sure. So I left my corporate job three years ago to start my own business because I have better added value to the small business owner. My mantra is big business doesn't grow the economy. Small business grows the economy. So in addition to outsourcing and working with other small business owners, I also do forensic work. I'm a CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner. And I investigate fraud and embezzlement and terrorist financing, partnership dis disagreements. And um, I, as of recent, I became an expert witness testifying in court, federal court cases. So Rhea had asked me to come here because there's a lot that I can teach you with being a, you are small business owners and independent business owners. And that, you know, I can teach you a couple of things that you should be aware of. Kevin Lawson, uh, first picked up a professional camera about 15 years ago. Uh, started in Orlando, a little company by the name of Dynasty Modeling, recruiting models. And it was one of my friends, and he gave me his old camera and had me shoot a lot of behind the scenes photos and videos, and just kind of grew from there. Um, I shot everything from music videos and, and models, to now I specialize in corporate headshots. So we own a studio in West Palm Beach, close to the airport, the Palm Beach International Airport, and most of what we do are corporate headshots. Started out as a senior portrait photographer and did critical events around Washington, D.C. Um, just to tell a little bit how I fell into weddings, met a co photographer um, and asked, Do you want to come out and assist? Which I definitely suggest that to anyone who wants to get into weddings. I said, Sure. Went out on a Saturday and I was hooked. From the day I went out there and picked and flipped my first dress, I knew I was going to do weddings for the rest of my life. <laughs> Uh, eventually moved to West Palm and um, had a full studio, pretty much did families, babies, portraits, and then just decided, nope, weddings is what I want to do. So um, now I'm on the Treasure Coast. Most recently started and partnered with my new partner, Keisha, who's over here. <laughs> she started out as my assistant. A mutual friend said, can you teach her photography? Um, next thing you know, she's a fast learner and now we're business partners. So we have a new photography business um, called Light Mary. It's kind of the new fresh trend in the wedding business in, in the business. And um, we're, I'm excited to be back. I was a longtime member here 20, since 20 years ago. Um, and hopefully um, I'll be back. A nice group of people. Thank you for having me. Michael. Um, currently, I work at the Pro Shop for Photographers, which is part of the Public Photographic Center in downtown West Palm Beach. It's a camera store. We carry all the major brands, Leica, Nikon, Canon, Sony. Um, I've worked at uh, camera stores since I was 16 years old and done photography as a freelance um, on the side that whole time. And I won't tell you how many years that is, but it's a lot. Uh, um, and again, I shot, my uncle was into photography and he got me started as a little kid and I just loved photography my whole life and never worked at doing anything but camera stores and photography. And I do, because of my years of experience, I managed the camera shop that was in North Palm Beach for 40 years. And unfortunately, as we've all seen, camera stores don't always survive these days. So that one's not there anymore. So luckily I found a spot at the Palm Beach Photographic Center and I enjoy it very much. We have a school there, we teach photography upstairs, um, and we have a store downstairs and a museum where we exhibit work and it changes on a month-to-month -month basis. And we're actually a 501C, so if we do manage to make any money down in the store, it gets funneled back up into the school to keep the, the school alive. So that's uh, been my passion. I consider myself an equipment expert, um, and I'd be glad to help anybody that needs it. Thank you. Okay, now, it's your turn to write questions, please print so I can read it. And if you want the question to be directed to a particular person on the panel, or a couple of people, that's fine, or 
just want to ask everybody a particular question. Uh, for example, you know, how did you get started? Um, maybe uh, how do you get your clients? Whatever comes to your mind, if you'd like to ask them. I have a question. Can you all tell that Helen wrote these? Because you're so nice to me. <laughs>
How did you transition from standard portraits to luxury portraits, and what sets your luxury part up, uh, portraits apart from other than maybe major competitions? Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, when I started, I'm a pure designer. So, um, and I, I worked many years in a high-end boutique firm in Clark Gable. So, I, I probably transferred to this high luxury home. And I always felt that they look, and actually the, the work that we did at a design firm was polished many, many times. And this is what I tell my clients, is that if they see, if you have your room polished in a magazine, and maybe you haven't invited your friends yet. They are going to just pass by the magazine and they are not going to recognize that it's your home. So I just saw the opportunity and, and, and I feel that if you have a portrait of your family in that place, your family, your friends are going to recognize that place. And that makes it your own and it's, People want to differentiate, these high-end people want to be, be different, and they pay high money for that. But they are actually not different, because actually if you put uh, you know, a, a space of them in a magazine, nobody is going to recognize that space, because it's like blood. So what I say is that I put really the emotion, the love, and the really personalization of that and the funny thing is that I saw that, but I actually didn't know how to get there. So it took, it was a journey. And going to PPA um, convention and seeing all these papers, all these friends, all these things, really inspired me to, to, to build our brand. I actually went to three brands and I built them and look at them and said, they are not high end enough. I took everything out and built them again, they are not high end enough. That's perfect. That question actually was the one that I wrote that was just for you, but Elise had written another one that was for everybody. So that one was for her. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay. Great answer, yeah. Yeah, that was really I love that that you said that you, without you know, the personalization, that you use love and by adding their family portrait. Yeah. And it's an actually very good selling point. <laughs> okay, this is to all the panelists. And uh, how would you advise younger people thinking of pursuing a photographic career? It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll take your thoughts again and we'll go down. Yeah, well, uh, so what was the question again? Okay. <laughs> To me, if I'd like to add something to that, it to me it's not just younger photographers because, like Terry, wanted to get, you know, know in the last three four years she started her career and she dabbled in it, I mean, you say along the way, and then when she retired from it. So I think about I, you know when I've gone to different things, it's not just the younger photographers trying to get it, it's also you yes. know let's say old like older people who've been in another career. Yes, uh, I actually got uh, that question recently, and um, the way I answer it, the way I feel, I think that it, the artistic and photography, you know, you can get that from anywhere. You have to learn how to sell. You have to learn how to sell. If you are not able to sell your work, you are, and you have no business. So my advice is, okay, just yes, focus on your photography skills, focus on your artistic skills, but please, by God, learn how to sell and learn how to manage the business because uh, if not, you're screw up. Uh, I would offer two pieces of advice. One is <clears throat> to learn the business, to learn about lighting, to learn that the camera is actually a box you let light into. That's how it takes its picture, right? Um, so learn the business. The second part is be patient. If you set your, if you decide who you're going to be in the beginning, a high-end photographer, low-end photographer, you know, volume, um, 
Be patient with your prices. Be patient with yourself. And let it happen. Give it time. That's the... Does that make sense? Does that sound good? Yeah. No, we don't. Have a lot of mix it. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some, some will know what I mean, yeah, and some are like, eh. Oh, it doesn't happen over there. Right, yeah. yeah. It doesn't do it. So that's what I would say. Yeah, it doesn't really happen over there. <laughs> okay, Christine. Uh, I would say to intern with someone to learn the role. You have to be a sponge, you have to be receptive. It's not only in photography, it's any business. You know, how do you make the leap? You have to be receptive to criticism, constructive criticism, positive reinforcement. Um, and then I would say make sure it's something you love. Because if you don't love it, it's not gonna come through. It's just gonna be a job. I'd say, I guess just to add something different is focus on the brand identity. that are actually making money and doing this for real, like, you guys were right. So, understand who you are, what you're offering, what differentiates yourself. That's why I being a luxury high-end photographer, it, there's something to that. So, everybody that's looking for a luxury high-end photographer for a print that you can put on your um, on your wall, they're gonna look for you and everybody's gonna refer you. So, like right now, and when I focus on headshots, everybody refers me on Facebook. So, if anybody is looking for a headshot photographer, they tag Kevin, they tag KB on media. And um, just focus on that and understand what your customer's needs are. And um, that's the, the two main things that I focus on. And I'm actually going to take it from there because I agree with you. I don't think I actually really got going with weddings until I decided weddings was going to be my specialty. I did a little bit of everything. I did commercial, real estate. And once people knew me, it was like, oh, yeah, like Cap Studio. That girl with the last name that does weddings. And she does weddings. So it became a specialty. And pretty much um, most of my, I do pretty much no advertising. My referrals <coughs> from caterers, event places refer me, and they know me as a wedding photographer. So definitely find that. Um, I do say, I know she had talked about sales. Um, with weddings, we don't do, unfortunately, we don't do a lot of sales anymore. Brides want, if you're doing weddings, they want all the images. So you need to come up with a way why you're gonna charge these prices. Get as much as you can up front, but there has to be a reason, because let me tell you, there's. 400 photographers out there now for weddings. When I was doing, first started, there was just a few of us that, you know, were specialized. Now, I don't know how, you just have to, you know, make yourself different than the next. Find something that when they look at your pictures, wow, I have to have that photographer. There's gotta be a reason, it can't just be you're good. Yeah, you have to learn your trade, learn your lighting. Um, best way is maybe find a photographer that you like their work. Go out and ask any of us, don't, Whenever anyone asks me, that's how these girls got started. I'm like, sure, come on out. You're my dress fixer for a while and um, decide if weddings is what you want to do and then put your own twist to it. You know, don't copy someone else's work, but look at it, know why you like it, but then go ahead and find your own because the only way you're going to really make it is to be a little bit different than that next wedding. In the wedding, this is the wedding business. I agree with what uh, they've all said. What I always tell young people or people that are trying to actually become a working photographer and make a living at it is find a successful photographer that's very good at what they do and beg them to assist. You know, if you have to do it for nothing, just go learn from them. Uh, I can't tell you how many photographers have told me, you know, that I taught this assistant the ropes and then they started their own business and. That's how it works, you know. These people that are successful, they're successful for a reason because they're good at what they do, and you can learn so much just by working for them several times a year or whatever it takes to get that knowledge. Obviously, you have to have the basic knowledge. I do recommend that you know young people, especially, take classes enough to learn their craft as far as operating the equipment successfully and that type of thing. But the techniques that actually make the stuff saleable can be learn best from a working photographer that's very good at it, even if it's for free. <laughs> and all, I mean, all three of us here have worked and assisted and we started, you know, not started, but worked under Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And the confidence that it gives you and the, the amount of learning is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, this question is for Mike. And what is you feel is the future of mirrorless cameras versus the you know the DSLR? 
I think mirrorless cameras are going to be definitely the dominant um, medium going forward. There's still going to be good DSLRs for a while because there's a lot of traditional photographers that have the glass and, and are used to it and that type of thing. But the advantages that the mirrorless cameras offer are, are so fantastic that there's no question they're going to be the dominant uh, medium, especially with video. And we find that a lot of the people are shifting towards video these days. And the mirrorless cameras are so far superior for video than the DSLRs. Mm -hmm. The autofocus is much more accurate. They're smaller and they're lighter, and, and like Carolyn and I talked about, you get tired of carrying all this big, bulky stuff, you know? But the real benefit is in the performance. They're faster motor drive speeds, better autofocus. I mean, some of the Sony cameras, the autofocus points cover the entire screen. They have over 400 focus points. So when you have a moving subject, it can follow it flawlessly. Whereas, I, you know, like I still shoot and I got it, it's great stuff. I have DSLRs. You really can't use the autofocus for video in a Nikon DSLR because it, it surges. You have to manually focus. It's totally different with Sony and, and the new Nikon and Canon. So I do feel that mirrorless is, is not only the future, it's the present. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, this one's for Christine. Um, what are uh, IRS trends towards the photography business and if you want to, there's more than, there's three questions here, so you want to answer each one on your own and create with them. IRS trends towards photography businesses. Um, I had just mentioned, I just recently read a court case about the importance of separating your business and your personal <coughs> expenses. So I would advise many of, many photographers, as many small business owners, make sure you get an LLC. It's okay to do everything in your personal name, that's fine. You can still separate it by getting a separate bank account, a separate credit card, and make sure you track all of your purchases separately. You can use Microsoft Excel. You don't have to go and buy QuickBooks or some major accounting package. You can use Microsoft Excel to track your expenses. One of the things the IRS is tracking down on is sales tax, right? So it's making sure because of this Wafer, Amazon decision and sales tax and Nexus and whatever it is, it's now opening the gates on what's considered taxable and what's not taxable. So there used to be this gray area of, okay, well, it's not taxable if you sell this or if you don't sell this. Now it's, it's opened the gates for every state to look at all those gray rules and now make a definitive opinion on what's considered taxable or not. The other thing I wanted to mention was in that court case, the LLC, a photographer was sued for whatever reason, for a client sued them. It then opened up the, they were an LLC. It then opened up the ability for them to look at their financial records. Once their financial records was open, then it showed that there was no differentiation in expenses. There was commingling of funds. So then what happened was the LLC went out the window because the court can use something called lifting the veil of the LLC. Once they lift the veil of the LLC, your personal assets are no longer protected and the judgment can now go to your <coughs> car, your house, your bank account, anything personal. So that's one thing that I would say is make sure you understand the sales tax rules of what you're selling or what you're not selling, um, and also don't commingle. Okay, next question for you. Okay. Um, sales tax pitfalls. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's you've already answered that. Yeah, so I mean, the, the rule of thumb with sales tax is if you can, <coughs> Feel it, touch it, hold it, that's considered tangible. If you can't hold it, feel it, touch it, then it's not subject to sales tax. Can I keep in real quick? Yeah. Speaking of that, because I earlier really about a photographer, yeah. an image. Yeah. If you're not getting that USB, because these days they download it from the cloud, yeah. do you have to charge separately for that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Okay. Um, this one is for Carolyn. Um, what is your favorite color photography not it's basically some if you can't it, the USB is still considered the cloud it's still considered oh, yes. a digital oh. it's still considered a digital medium because we took the USB all yeah. our packages so we didn't have to charge sales tax it's still considered a digital media so mm -hmm. being that it's still digital but if you package that I just read the rule okay. before we started if you package it with an album or That's with something, we used to do it together. Yeah, then the entire thing would be packaged. Yeah. Now people question it. Good question you never asked. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Um,
also his third part of the question was about them challenging your deductions and things like that. Yeah, I mean, they they have the final say. So if they will disallow something, there's nothing to send. Quarterly? Immediately? Quarterly. What? Quarterly. I just do it at the end of the year and then send Don't it. do that. The other thing that's happening now with that is they're trying. They're trying to get as much money as they possibly can out of out of people. So you you can now be subject to number one late filing penalties, and number two not filing when you're supposed to. What? Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. I know. I'm just here. Yeah. I just do mine by April fifteenth or whatever, and like don't do it. Do it quarterly. There's a stub that you print out, and it's an estimated payment stub. You just put your name, your address, your social security number, and send them the money. It's Without fine. having deductions? Don't do it. Send 15%. Mm -hmm. Because so what happens when you're a 1099, that's the other thing that I try and encourage people to become an LLC. Is when you're a 1099, you're responsible for the employee and the employer portion of FICA. FICA is Social Security and Medicare, right? And that's why. And you're 1099, you're paying both sides of it, plus your federal income tax, plus being a sole proprietor. So all in, you're already at 20%. So, you know, being that we now have the new Tax Cut Jobs Act, which this allows a lot of deductions now because the standard is so high, mm -hmm. you itemizing isn't gonna make any, any sense. No, you can't. So you might as well become an LLC and get the benefit of being a business. So you're not responsible for the self-employment tax anymore, so you're already keeping 7.65% in your pocket, and you also have the limited liability of being a business owner. Can I just have your number? <laughs> <laughs> take a bag, guys, take a, re take a reusable shopping bag, and yeah. my card's in there. Oh, perfect. perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm taking notes, too. <laughs> Okay, um, some of these questions are maybe something either you asked before, but uh, I'll try and make a, a determination of what I want to ask you or what I think they want to know. Um, Carolyn, uh, this question is for you about wedding pricing, also packages or a la carte, and examples of package pricing. Examples as far as giving my prices up? Um, I can just give you kind of a breakdown. I actually have to say that this is something that I just recently changed because of the idea of the digital images and the cloud and brides being okay with just wanting the images. So making it more about the experience they're getting from the wedding photographers, whereas before it was about what they were getting. You have to remember I'm from the old days when we gave the wedding album. Um, I do have to say that I book a lot of clients because I offer wedding albums. For those of you that are not offering it, which is a lot of the new wedding photographers, are really missing out because a lot of them will say to me, we visited four photographers and they did not, because they don't, I guess, know how to make albums, maybe they don't want to. Um, so I still offer it, but I have changed, I used to package it, and I do keep one package um, where everything's included. It's kind of like my whopper. So basically, um, just, Tell yourself um, what do you want to make there's always that person that will get your highest package when the parents come in to their first daughter getting married they all want albums especially when your other photographer friends are not giving them you will get the job I mean if they like you they like your work um, so I'm letting off some of the little secrets here so albums are a plus um, if you don't a lot of the companies now you don't even have to know how to do them um, so see me if you want to know any of them um, you can just drag and drop images. So offer wedding albums, okay? And um, you may want to do them out of cart because of the tax, especially that's been a big question of mine. I've always charged, I feel like it doesn't cost me anything to charge tax, so I always felt like I'm gonna charge it and just be safe. So I always charged it on the amount, but I do have a lot of customers now that will say, we just want the digital images, why are you charging me tax? So that's why, that was a great question. So I have rechanged <coughs> it to where the USB now is a gift, and that way I felt like I didn't have to read text. But now that I know, I can just include it in. Um, so packaging, I would start with, um, 
it's hard because if you start out low, you're always gonna be known as that low photographer, okay? And it's gonna be hard to break out of it because their friends know what they got. So I would say start somewhere in the middle. You can't just walk out one day and say, I'm gonna get this. Like, I feel like I've earned those prices. Um, a lot of people come to me now, they just, they want my work, but I've never been super high, but I've never been super low. I've always been at the higher middle, I guess you could say. And um, I know there's a lot of speakers that say there's no market in the middle. They're either super high or be low end. Well, I've made a career of 30 years being in the middle, and I've stayed steady throughout. Um, so I would say just find what works for you. If you want to go after the higher market, then um, you know just make sure that your work backs it up. Make sure you have something that the others don't have. Know your trade. Know lighting. Um, and um, you know, if you want to do super low, I don't suggest it because for me, to work weddings are hard, hard work, and you know, get paid for what you do. So, and I really think they will come to you. So, who asked the question, by the way? Oh, right here. Okay, sorry. Paula. Well, so, Paula, yeah, and you can always, you know, see me if you want to kind of see. I just don't want to get out my prices. So no, 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 that's not oh. actually what I was looking for. Oh, okay. I'm looking more for strategies on prices. For strategies. You know, it, okay, so I, I'm just starting out. I do out three. To, okay, that's but okay. I, I do three. I do one that's here for that for those weekend, those Sunday weddings that I want on the slow months. I don't want them to be like, she's way up here. I can't afford her. Mm -hmm. I want to work. That being said, that now as I'm getting older and I don't want to work as much, I have kind of gotten rid of that one because it's just not worth it. So, but if you're starting out and you need portfolio work, um, so, I, but don't go super low. I no, 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 no. Right. Yeah, so go somewhere where you think you're comfortable, that you feel comfortable, um, but find, I say three. I think if you have too many, it's too much for them to look at. Right. So you've kind right. of got your middle. I mean, your bottom, your middle, and then your super. Do one big one. Right. Like, and I'll be honest, right now in the wedding business, they're getting the higher packages. Mm -hmm. it, it does do this with the economy, uh -huh. but I found that when the economy was really low years ago, I stayed in the game. So a lot of those super high $10,000 wedding photographers were hurting. Mm -hmm. Because when people, it didn't matter, they had money and things were going down. So that's stay with the kind of the economy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is a question for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were just at imaging, and there was a lot of albums. Is there a particular um, album company you like? <coughs> um, I yeah, there's quite a few of them out. Um, I like a place called um, Zono Z N O. Mm -hmm. It's sort of been used, and they have the nicest looking album at the best price. Um, Miller's has great stuff. Um, I don't really use Reedy anymore. Miller's has some really cool different, but I have to say that Zono is catching up to them with the different album covers with the metal and you know different choices switching off. But it's the easiest program. The problem with a lot of um, the companies, you have to have an album design, um, you know, app to work on the album and then send it to them. What I love about the Zono is that it's all in theirs. So you just download your images, drag and drop. You know, we'll have to spend hours on Photoshop. But what I do suggest is any of you that are using that, don't put that album company that you use on your social media page because they do offer to regular people. And your clients are gonna go on there and see these great prices that you're getting on these and say, well, why are you charging me this price? I see this on so many photographers' social media. So don't put them out there with their, you know, you won't be able to say that you're, but they really come a long way where you can go on there, drag and drop, and, and it's your images that are gonna sell. And my clients want albums, so I know a lot of people don't off them, but mine all, they come in and they love my albums. Yeah. Do you have, I'm sorry, do you have samples that you show them? Like, does the not offer sample albums? Yes, and that's another thing they tell me. And I'm just telling you what they tell me when they come in, they'll say, oh, the other photographers we saw, they didn't even have an album, they just did. I know the young generation just all wanna show it on their iPod. But um, iPads. But with me, uh, they love that they can touch. There's still something about touching and feeling an album. So yes, I have three or four. And then the other thing I do is I update them. So those of you that have been wedding photographers for a long time, I mean, I'm guilty of this. It gets stale, and things change. And I don't want to be. I'm an older photographer with all these young new. I don't want to appear old. So I get rid of it. If that dress is outdated, um, you get sample prices at any of the album companies. Just keep them, you know, fresh. Um, okay, I'm gonna. This is one that everyone.
everybody a blanket answer. Um, what is your biggest mistake that you learned from running your business over the years? Always no blame. <laughs> 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 uh, my biggest mistake, uh, well, I guess my biggest mistake uh, was believing that um, I have to be the best photographer in order to be able to charge my price. And uh, at one point I was, uh, for those who know me, I love to compete and I love competition and I was winning merits and first places and second places and I was coming home. And one day I remember that I did really well. And I actually came back crying the whole ride because I said, how come I'm so good at think that that's when I realized that I need to do something about it. It was not only about being good, but it's all understanding how to be able to sell. Um, and that's when I started taking sales courses, like hardcore sales courses, the one that's real to space, you know, and, and reading and reading about sales, and that uh, actually made it because now I can sell my own photo to my mom, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that really changed the game. career was in, was, was um, self-taught. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So I, I wish I knew then what I know now, follow my own advice, and start high. And be patient. Because I think it would have come. That's, I, I don't know if that's a mistake or a wish or what, but Start with high prices? Yeah. Yes, stay at the high end. Do the high end stuff. Instead of like a $600 wedding that I did for many years. Not many years, but many, many weddings. Mm -hmm. I should have gone. Uh, I couldn't ask. I couldn't. Yes, I cannot do that. I once, I, I heard a coach saying that you, you need to put your price on where you want to be okay. and not thinking about implementing because once you start. You are, if you have certain kind of prices, you are going to attract certain kind of people. So the time that you get your high prices uh, up, then you have to fire all that people and get like to this new market, and market yourself in a different way, then attract all these new people, then you go uh, again, you lose the job. So you just need to find your price, even though you think that it's going crazy, and then start marking that market that time they're going to come. But thinking that you have to slowly rise your price is, uh, is not a good strategy. Yeah, I didn't have the confidence. I probably still don't, but. <laughs> yeah. You just have to do it. <laughs> and deal with it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Christine. Um, <coughs> biggest mistake? There's so many. Um, <laughs> I think mine was undervaluing my talent when you're first starting out and you're desperate and you're like, oh, you want to pay me 40 cents an hour to do like 92 hours of work? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know, don't undervalue yourself. You know your talent, you know you're worth it, but don't undervalue yourself. Another 
thing I would say is maybe separating the business from personal life a little bit. I, um, I look back and I think photography was my whole life and maybe I missed some things with my child who's grown now, is maybe separating it. You know, learning when to tell clients, no, I'm not gonna come out on a Sunday, um, which I do now, but it took me years of learning how to say no. Um, I actually think they respect you more when you say, no, these are my hours and I'm not gonna work on Sunday. So if I could go back, that would have been something a little more, um, you know, like you, I just loved photography. I ate, slept, and you know, so I just, that was most of the life. So if I was given a little more time with her family. I think I'm just gonna echo what a couple of the other people said. I'm gonna use an example where the store that I used to manage, we had a custom lab, and a lot of the photographers used us for their frames. And so we got to see all their work, and I'm not going to name any names or anything, but there was a situation where there was one person that did a lot of weddings, and I didn't feel like that person was extremely good at it, but they marketed their stuff really well, and they charged high prices. And there was another person that was absolutely fantastic. If, if I ever decided to get married again, and I'm still married, but I mean, I would use her. <laughs> she was awesome but her prices were lower. And so I was talking to her one time and she said, you know, I just lost a job to so-and-so. Of course, I didn't say that I know so-and-so. She said, because the client looked at both of our packages and she automatically felt that this person was better because she was charging twice what I wanted. Wow. And yet I knew that this one that was charging less was far superior photographer. So don't undersell yourself, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, this is one of my questions because I think this is very important because there are people in this guild that I have used as mentors or I have reached out to. So my question is what mentor or mentors have helped you grow as a professional photographer or just a professional in your business? Oh, definitely Tom Collins. Uh, I know that they will know him. Uh, uh, Larry, too. He was, uh, uh, when I decided to switch careers, um, I actually, uh, I, 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 I'm a person that needs to uh, control things. <laughs> so uh, I actually went back to, uh, to college, and uh, technical college to study photography, and I did it for one year and a half, and I pestered Tom Collins every day, and he asked me questions, answering and answering and, and I got so much. He was the one who, who introduced me to the Miami Hill and and I'm so grateful for that. He was the first and he will always have his way. Um, he actually was coming to home tonight but he um her um mother passed away in the winter. Um but yes Tom Collins. He's 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 uh he's not very well known but I mean he's uh he's very well known in Miami and and sometimes um, it's just angels that they happen to have in your life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Nellie Kiros was my first <coughs> mentor, which many of you know, uh, and we're still friends. We, we parties all night long at, uh, at Imaging, mm -hmm. pretty fun. Um, and then I had two others that taught me the wedding business, which I shot for a couple of years and then decided it was too hard to do, dang it. <laughs> Such hard work. <laughs> Um, that was Don Shoons Burns and Frank Danino, who has since passed from cancer. They were awesome. Um, it's a couple, but believe it or not, other CPAs in the field. I'm not a CPA. I don't pay taxes, so I let other people do that. I'm good at what I do, um, but I only know what I know. So I go and seek out others in my field and find out how did you learn about that? Why did you learn about that? You know, I may not be a CPA, but I can still read about tax code and tax law and changes and things that will affect my small business owners. Um, and then I have friends in my head because I read a ton. So Oprah is one of my mentors. Or you know, I'll be sitting in a situation, and I'll have a conversation, and I'll say, "What would Oprah do in this situation?" You know, and it's like. You know, I may not know her personally, but she, you know, she is in my head because you can align your circumstance to someone else. You know, mm -hmm. they come from nothing and now there's something. It's like, well, how did you get there? Thank you. Hey, Kevin. I'm trying to think. Um, so I haven't really had any um, recently. I started like watching Gary V and how he kind of um, puts out his marketing content and kind of shares his story. Uh, just kind of being everywhere all the time. Took a workshop 
class last year with uh, Peter Hurley, the uh, head shot photographer. So um, sitting down and um, taking his course was, was really, really interesting. But um, when we first got started in Orlando, it was just kind of a team of us that started the studio up there and we just kind of pushed each other. So we were all kind of learning at the same time. And so we kind of mentored each other. Mind, um, who I followed a lot when I started was Hanson Song. I used to attend anytime he was anytime locally, couldn't wait. Loved just the, his style of work, his lighting, his classical portraiture. Um, and then also, I would just say photographer friends. Um, years ago, coming here to the guild meeting, there was a bunch of us that were very close stitch that used to just hang out and we would just go try things. Bring cameras. Um, I would say <coughs> Dick Robertson for lighting. He always used to tell me, because I was very, back then, studio lighting, off-camera flash, and trying to work with available light. He'd say, Carolyn, just look for the light. It's there. And no matter when we were around, like Dick Robertson would say, don't you see it on his face? And I'd say, no, but I can create it. He'd say, no. And now it's so funny. All I do is find the light. I try to tell Keisha, don't you, like, you start to see it. But Dick Robertson, if any of you have met him, has he still come here to the meeting? Yes. 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 Phenomenal how he sees, if you've ever had a chance to go out with him, and he'll show you things on a piece of paper. He'll find the light, it's amazing. Oh. Yeah, he can talk, so yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right guy. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's maybe not an appropriate question for me because I haven't made my, the majority of my money from photography, but um, like I mentioned, I was very young when I got into it, and. Um, the owner of the store that I managed for 41 years, I actually used to, I was 12 years old, I used to ride my bike to the store as a customer and just stay in his ear, and he was a brilliant man. His name was John Wetterman, and he graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology, and he ended up being my boss for over 40 years, and he was a perfectionist, which if any of you have ever worked for a perfectionist, you know it's not easy, but it does push you. And so if I had to name one person, it would have been him. It just uh, made me realize that you could just Got to give it 150 percent all the time. You know, don't call it in, uh, and you'll be successful. You know. I want to take uh, Nellie Quiros. I credit her partially. I'm not the only person. I credit her with helping me, pushing me along to become a certified professional photographer. Yeah. And I went to her at a studio in Vero Beach, and she set up the lights. Then she pushed them all back. And she said, okay, I have a family coming in, now you set up the lights and you take their pictures. And um, it took me three tries. I passed the test right away. It took me three tries to get the images uh, to be accepted. But the third time, we were, Ray and I were in Savannah with friends having, and we were having lunch with someone at some restaurant by the water there. And she, Nellie texted me, did you check your email yet? I said, no, I'm too chicken. And she said, well, hurry up and check it. So I did check it, and I passed. And I screamed in the restaurant. And people were looking at us, but I was so happy, and I credit her a lot with, she was not the only person, uh, but I credit her a lot with encouraging me. And I think that's what you need a lot of time. You need that other person to encourage you. Um, okay, this is more of a business question. I guess this is what this is. Um, what are the benefits or negatives to a 501c3 in addition to photo biz? No, I, who who are mine? You better have slow YouTube. Just, just <laughs> it's for Rhea because she we're, we're like we're trying to figure out for her um, for a charity branch of photography yeah, what right. the benefits and negatives are yeah. to a 501c and all of that. So. Yeah. I already spoke to her about it, but basically you, you're under more scrutiny. So with 501c3s, you have to be very cognizant of what's considered restricted funds and unrestricted funds and how you disperse those dollars and who's using those dollars, who has access to the, your money. Do you have a board? Are you taking notes? Are you remitting this information to the government time? There's lots of stringent rules associated with nonprofits. <coughs> But I feel like we keep seeing recently a lot of a lot of people around us, just like regular people, having these five hundred one c threes, and we're like, if they can do it, why can't we? You know, why can't we do it um, for her breast cancer side? So I'm just 
So yeah. I, when I heard him say, like, of the sales that we have, we funnel through, and you know, like, because I know she's very um, meticulous and very good at keeping things very um, legal. She's on the up and up. She does, I was like, I think that it would be a good choice for me, but I didn't know if any, since I heard him mention 501, I didn't know if anybody else might have been thinking of having a cherry branch to their photography. Yeah, like I said, you just have to be cognizant of the rules associated with having a nonprofit and how strict it is over the dollars that you take in. Yeah. yeah. It's just different reporting requirements, I should say. Which I think, I think that as long as it, the benefits are there, I feel that that's just logistical, you know, and as long as you're a good record keeper and you're mm -hmm. above board, and I feel like that, then that's something that, that could be a, a good benefit. Yeah. I put her in touch with someone that I do I do low photo work for nonprofits because I know their dollars are tied up, so I charge almost nothing for my services. And I put her in touch with someone who just went through the entire process, oh, the legal okay. process, the state process. And, you know, like I said, I only know what I know, so I can only guide you to mm -hmm. what I can tell you. But if I know someone who's been through the process, that's the added value that I bring to my industry. Is I'm going to put you in touch with someone who can tell you a whole lot better than I can. So tomorrow I'm going to be like, Miss Christine said she put you in. Did, did you contact them? Did you write them? <laughs> <laughs>
you know, the marketer. So that's a, that's a struggle, trying to balance all of that. And also revamping my business map. So I don't use the term business plan because business plan is just one way to get there. So I use a business map. There's multiple routes to get to your end goal. So it's always revising my business map. I think my biggest struggle is the growing pains of getting bigger. Um, so right now we have more employees at the studio and understanding that you have to create different systems to make sure that everything runs um, because you have to start writing paychecks Kind of learning how to kind of let go and there's give and take and you know, let go. Okay, my biggest struggle would probably be the accounting. I still kept everything in a shoebox up until a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that would probably be it. And the other thing was social media. I didn't grow up with social media, so it was very hard for me to um, transition. Um, Keisha was talking a lot. If I didn't have her, I wasn't even on social media up until, I don't know, a couple years ago. I think because I was kind of spoiled, I didn't need it to get the clients. Um, I thought I didn't need to be on it, which you actually do. You still need to have a presence. I'm realizing that now. People need to see your name. Even though you've got the clients coming in, they want to see their images. They want a sneak peek on Monday. Um, if not, by the time your images are done, they're stale because their friends have set all their cell phone pictures up. So social media would probably be the hardest. Um, now I'm really trying because now the younger brides are not using Facebook. So I finally have Facebook down and now it's Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm real bad about just getting on Instagram. So luckily I have um, Keisha, who's you know, part of that new young generation. So maybe finding somebody from that younger generation that can do your social media for you. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really marketing yourself as a, whether it's a photographer or a retail store, you've got to realize what you do better than somebody else, your competitor or what you offer that's better than someone else, and just get word out there to, you know, to let people know why you have an added value, why you're the person that they should be dealing with. Hmm. Yeah, these are really good answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and being we're talking about social media, um, how do you use social media to get the word out? You know, do um, you use a variety of things besides the Facebook and the Instagram? Or what do you use and how do you use it? How often do you post and things like that? Um, well, I, I, I often, I, I'm so, I'm a very quiet person and I struggle a lot with social media. The way I use of social media, I found out is to actually, I have a present, very little, small present. I know that I have to use the word. I'm doing that as I try for me, for real. But what I do in social media is I follow people. I actually uh, follow people. So the, the way that it works is that I, I just see people that I, I think that I would love to meet, and I follow them and their friends and see what they do and where they go. And at some point, I end up networking with them because they know where they go, what events they, they attend. So actually, I do a reverse social media. I follow people. 
changed how people are buying now and they want to believe in you and then they will buy whatever you're selling so that's why social media is so important they yeah. need to believe in you believe in your mission believe in what it is that you are selling or you know what it is that you're and then they're like you know what you're so cool I want you to be my accountant or I want you yeah. to be my photographer no I will say there's um, her name's Debbie Weems and she does LinkedIn I would highly recommend taking Debbie Weems' LinkedIn course. She does them all the way from Delray to Palm Beach, and she is a LinkedIn guru, and I mean, she could just grow your business leaps and bounds by some of the tips that she gives. How do you spell her with W-E-M-Y-S-S, -S, I think. Debbie Weems. She is the LinkedIn guru. Um, Thank you. Well, I guess unlike everybody else, I grew up on social media. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, back with AOL chat rooms, if you guys remember those. Like, yeah. Yeah, they were still considered yeah. social media. Talk to the that, that was, that was <laughs> the original. The original. Hey, what are you doing? We what both were like the same for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you talk. <laughs> so, I mean. Not like this. I can talk for hours and going many different directions on social media. So I guess, who asked that question? What do you really want to know? Like, what's your real question? Listen. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Question. I did it. Social media question. Well, right. one of your questions. That was one of my questions. Oh. <laughs> so I guess I'll open it up. What do you guys really want to know about social media? Because we can go in any kind of direction. Like and we can talk about anything. Like personal versus business. I have a big problem. Um, did not grow up with social media, <laughs> so I'm having a big problem defining what I post, and I don't tend to post personally very often. I um, I don't. Really put my stuff out there. But for business, I tend to, I try to keep up and do that. But based on what people are saying, no, they want to get to know you. They, so if they look up Paula Stanton, they want to see what, how old are her kids and where did she do, or what did she do at the beach and what did she have for dinner last night? And I don't post that stuff. So I'm really torn about how to handle that. So, so there's a quote that goes, um, people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. Yep. For people to connect with you, they really, in, in this social media world, and it started with reality TV when MTV was putting it out and 
all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to connect with you so badly mm -hmm. because they want to see themselves in you. And they want to do business with people that they see themselves in. People that have gone through their same struggles. People that have three and a half kids like, and a dog mm -hmm. and a white picket fence. They want to do business with those types of people. So the more that you can kind of put yourself out there and connect, and you don't have to share like personal things. Like if you don't feel comfortable sharing what you ate for breakfast, if you don't feel comfortable sharing that your pigeon died, like my dog, I, I made on my Instagram, on my business Instagram, because that's all I have. My dog is the CEO of Tradition Accounting. Aww. So like I'll do posts, I have a teacup Yorkie, and I'm like, you know, she'll be laying in the sun or you know her house or whatever. I'm like, the CEO is out to lunch right now. <laughs> we'll take your calls when we return, and it'll just yes. blow up. Yes. Like people will be like, because that's adorable. Like if you don't want to show yourself. Show your breakfast. Oh, you. Show yeah. your your the the bird in the tree. Show like you know a cute kid across the street playing. If you don't want to show yourself, think of something cute that's in your life and what you write <laughs> can be personal <laughs> as opposed to showing. You. No, I mean it's not that I. It's just that I'm not used to it. I'm just yeah. not used to doing that. You know, I I did an event the, the other night and and I had an assistant and I said I need you to take pictures of me too because I don't have any. You know, it's really hard, and, and so yeah. you, you almost have to hire a friend to say, okay, you're coming with me for a hundred bucks, and you're gonna spend the night, and which is really awkward. I'm just not <laughs> yeah. that, you know, so. you have to make yourself, and the more that you do it, the more you. Now I like look at my friends, and I'm like, I've turned into that person. Mm -hmm. I have to take a picture of my food, <laughs> yeah. or I have to take a picture of something cute <laughs> that we did tonight because I get ten new followers every mm -hmm. time I post. Interesting. And I'm a, I'm an introvert, so being up here is terrifying. Being on camera is terrifying for me. Um, but you just, it, it comes with practice. It's like going to the gym. Um, if you're going to the gym the first time you, you go, you can't lift as much as you want. But the more that you do it, the more that you put in those reps, you got to go through that pain. Mm -hmm. The amount of time that I spent looking on my camera and shooting videos and just talking to myself that nobody will ever see. <laughs> you know, like I spent hours doing that, you know, and it just comes with practice. And the more that you put out there, the more that you share. So now I have somebody that follows me. We shoot vlogs of behind the scenes of different gigs that we go to. So I started a YouTube channel. And people are just more and more connected. So you start putting it out there on, on your email newsletter. You start putting it out there on social media. And people that you don't even know will walk up to you and be like, oh, yeah, I see you. I've I seen your, um, see your logo. I see your name. I go everywhere with a shirt that says my, my logo on it because people that you've never met, they're going to feel like they know you. And hashtag so, everything. A lot of people have people look up the hashtag. Mm -hmm. Hashtag everything. Okay. So the answer is definitely do both then. Both personal and do both, but only share what you're comfortable with. Okay. Because remember that you have complete control over it. Right. You know, so step out your comfort zone as much as you can. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to share personal things, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, what people are looking for is they're looking to connect with you on certain aspects. Oh, I like coffee. Oh, I have a, a, a chihuahua. Um, and it, it's very superficial, superficial things that you can that you can really have people connecting you with, you with. Um, and then share the fact that you're an industry expert in whatever field that you're that you want to go into. So I, I think you were talking about weddings before. Mm -hmm. So talk about industry. It's talk about trends in weddings and, and share like your favorite um, bouquet that came out. Share your favorite um, dress trends and things like that. And really connect with people on that level so that it it comes across as personal and people will share have those share same shared interests, but you don't have to talk about everything like or places. You know. So like if you're yeah. out walking your dog or whatever, you're out at the park and you just happen to see it like that's what I would look for, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if you just happen to post, oh this would be a great backdrop for whatever, you know. I've been getting better at it, but it's just it is still such a struggle for me. So I think it's okay. It'll take time. Thank you. Um, I think Yeah. Um, as, as much as you said earlier, I'm an introvert myself. I'm considered to be young, and my age has been good. I would rather spend 24 hours shooting than spend 10 minutes on, on Instagram and Facebook. And I, when I get there, I don't even know what to post. Because you hear so many people telling me, you cannot be a jack of all trades. Your social media should be curated. And now you're telling me that it's important that people can relate to you. So how do you manage both? 
you, do some of them go into story and you still manage your page to be what you want it to be or do you mix and match your things that you like that are important to you with the posts that you make and, 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 and have it available so that, because I know you might do a post at two by six, it's still irrelevant. So how do you get that connection with people? So uh, I struggled with this. So now I have one, two, three, four, at least four Instagram pages. Um, and for the longest, I'll uh, get Because you hear all these things, and I think that's one of my first questions that I answered, is that you spend all this time listening to other people and like going back and forth and having these internal conversations about, oh, well, they said don't do this, and they said don't do this, and this person, they have a curated page, but this person just posts everything. Do whatever the hell you want. Like, it's, like yeah. at the end of the day, people are going to connect answer. with that, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so I have four different pages. I have one one page that is headshot happy hour, and it's specific. It's curated with all the headshots that I take. Another one is my business page, so my KBL media page, and then recently I started posting on my um, director Lawson page, which is more so pictures of me and just different things that I do. And it's really you're just testing out these different things. Mm -hmm. So as much time as you can spend on it. Do it because the more that you post, the more people that um, you're going to remind that you do what you do. Um, it's called top of mind awareness. Um, and be all places at all times if you can. And if you can't, hire other people. But at the end of the day, start at a specific point. So again, start where you feel comfortable and expand from there. You don't have to be everything to all people. Um, and another quote, I think they say, if you're everything to all people, then you're nothing to everybody. You know? So people are going to connect with you and what you specialize in. Um, and hashtag it up, hashtag there's, it up. There's four things that I think about um, over the course of my, my career. And like I went to school for marketing and everything like that, and I kind of put it all together as an a integrated marketing solution, right? So I call it the idea blueprint. So I is for identity, D is for distribution, E is for engagement, and A is for acquisition. Identity is knowing who you are and who your potential client is. Distribution is how are you going to reach those clients? Where are they hanging out? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? Are they on LinkedIn? Target them there. Um, ease for engagement. Why are they going to care? You want to entertain, empower, and um, engage with them in a way that they actually care who you are and what you do. And then A's for acquisition. How are you going to take all that attention and turn it into either um, subscribers, customers, views on your page, whatever it is? Um, once you follow those four steps, whatever you do, whatever route that you're, like whatever industry that you're going to do, um, just follow those four things and it, it'll direct you. Um, I, I, I think um, we have to close it up because we have to give out some awards tonight. I want to invite, as the program director, since we were talking about social media, next month, the third Tuesday of the month, uh, we have a speaker coming all the way from Jacksonville. Her specialty is Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you all to come, all of you to come, and uh, check her out, and uh, she, uh, uh, it's a, she was, I was talking to her yesterday, her name is Leslie Evans, and she said in preparing the program, she's had to change it because Instagram is changing so fast. She has to keep changing her program, so she's really up on everything for when she's doing the presentation. So I thank you all for coming. Please stay for our awards. Thank you all for such great <laughs>
Thank you. 